Welcome once again to the Hope Now Bible Study Series. In yesterday's presentation, we looked at the dangers of spiritualism. We saw how Satan can easily deceive those who venture on the forbidden ground of communicating with the spirit world. In today's presentation, we will look deeper into why it is impossible to communicate with the dead. We will see the Bible's clear teaching on the afterlife as we answer the question, what happens when you die? Your Bible has the answer. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, there are questions about the unknown. When our loved ones die, when we come into the grave, what will happen? Is there life beyond the grave? We thank you for you will assure us with your word the answers to this question. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1956, the Belgian Congo was caught in the grip of a vicious civil war. Dr. Paul Carlson's hospital was taken over by the rebel forces. Many hospital employees were killed. Unfortunately, Dr. Carlson was among them. When his body was found a few days after his murder, there was a New Testament in his jacket pocket. On one of its pages, the doctor had written the date. It was the day before he was shot. On that page, he had penned a single word, peace. Peace in the face of the worst of circumstances. Peace in the face of death. What gave Dr. Paul Carlson such peace? Is it possible for us to have this incredible peace when we face death? What can keep us from falling apart when death strikes? Experiencing the loss of a loved one is one of the most painful things a person can experience. The reason why is that we were not created to experience death. As we have studied previously, death is an unwelcome stranger that is the result of humanity's fall into sin. A God of love created us for eternal life. And death was never part of his plan. Our hearts and minds simply weren't wired for the pain and separation of death. There are so many questions surrounding death. What really happens to a person when they die? Do they go to heaven or hell, purgatory or nothingness? We know what happens to the physical body but it is there a spirit or a soul that goes somewhere. The Bible is not silent about what happens when we die. In fact, the truth about the afterlife was the very heart and hope of the early Christian church. And here's why. After Jesus died on the cross, his friends placed his body in the tomb. Pilate, the Roman governor, sent a guard, and his soldiers sealed the stone covering the mouth of the tomb with a Roman seal. It was impossible for his body to leave the tomb, or so they thought. Early Sunday morning, the Bible says, a brilliant angel descended from heaven and rolled back the stone that covered the door of that tomb. The resurrected Savior stepped forth as a mighty conqueror over death and the grave, the soldiers were struck down and dead as dead men by the glory of the angel. The story of Christ's resurrection was the driving power of the early Christian church. The Christians had a message to two of truest hope. The grave was not the final end. Those who died in Christ would someday live again. Their confidence in the resurrection stood in bright contrast to the beliefs of the pagans 
who had no hope beyond the grave. The catacombs under the city of Rome revealed the difference between the unbeliever's death and the death of the Christian. Written on the tombs of those who did not believe in Jesus Christ were hopeless inscriptions such as goodbye forever, goodbye for eternity. The writings on the Christian's tombs, on the other hand, were filled with hope and courage, goodbye until we meet again, or goodbye until the morning. Their hope and courage in the face of death was founded in the promise of their Savior. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Oh, I love that terminology. Jesus holds the keys of death and the grave. How? Because he rose from the dead. And as the author of life, he holds the right to unlock the grave for all who believe in him. The resurrection of Christ truly is the foundation of the Christian's hope. The Apostle Paul confirms this hope clearly in his message to the Corinthian believers. He says, if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. To understand what Paul is saying here, we need to go back to the creation to look at a few details of how man was formed and what God had to say to Adam and Eve about death. We have already had a presentation on how death came to our human race through the fall of Adam and Eve. But look at something interesting God told Adam after his fall. You shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweet of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. I can't emphasize enough that these verses we're looking at here in Genesis are the key to answering the question, what happens when you die? I don't miss the first point that the Bible says that in death we return to the dust from which we were taken. And now comes the key verse that unlocks the death question. It is the verse on how God formed Adam. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breath into his nostrils and breath the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Look at this carefully. God took the elements of the earth and made a body for man. When he was finished fashioning the body, he had only a lifeless corpse. It took something more to make him a living being. The Bible says that God breathed into Adam's nostrils and breathed of life, and man became a living soul. Here is a simple formula. Body plus breath equals a living soul. Body minus breath equals a lifeless corpse. Please don't miss this. Man does not have a living soul. Man is a living soul. The original Hebrew language of this text is very clear. Man did not receive a living soul. He became one. There is a huge difference. Death takes place when there is a separation of body and the breath of life. When the breath leaves the body, there is no more soul. Let's explore this further. King Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes describing death. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. But what is this spirit that goes back to God? It's not why many people think. 
Job defines what the spirit is. He says, all the while, my breath is in me, and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. The word spirit here is interchangeable with the word breath. This is the same breath of life that God breathed into Adam's nostrils when he created him. The spirit means life, the breath of life. And this spirit or this life is it in any kind of thinking being. It doesn't have a brain of its own as many mistakenly believe. It just simply means life. We know this spirit Spirit isn't anything more than life because of what the psalmist says in Psalm 146. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit breath departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, he plans, his plans perish. Oh, King David in this verse is very clear here. When a person dies, his breath leaves the body, his conscious thoughts stop. This harmonizes exactly with what Solomon said in this famous verse about death. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten, also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Can it be any clearer? The dead know nothing. And evidently, this text isn't just speaking of knowing nothing here on earth, because there are other places in the Bible that reveal that the dead are not conscious somewhere else, either after they die. The book of Psalms again. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. We go to the book of Job again to see what this silence is like. Job starts to put pieces together on what happens to a righteous person between death and their future resurrection. He says, But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last, and where is he? So man lies down and does not rise, till the heavens are no more. They will not take away, and they will not wake away, and they will not awake, nor be roused from their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in a grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me as a time, and, rede- and remember me. Then Job asks a question in his, and Job asks and answers his own question. If a man dies, shall he live again? And all the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. You shall call and I will answer you. Job uses the term sleep in speaking of death. Other Bible writers describe death the same way. And David wrote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. The prophet Daniel, speaking of death and the resurrection, describes it in this way, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The prophet Nathan told King David what would happen to him when his time to die came. When thy days are fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. But it's not just in the Old Testament writers and prophets who use the term sleep to describe death. This is the word that Jesus used to describe death as well. One day, Jesus received an urgent message from his friends in Bethany, informing him that Lazarus was very ill. But Jesus stayed where he was by the Jordan River 
for another two days. Finally, he told his disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. The disciples were confused as to why Jesus would want to wake up a sick man. They said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. On Christ's way to Bethany, as he and his disciples approached the city, Martha came running to meet him. When she saw Jesus, she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And this was true. Jesus loved healing people by a word or a miraculous touch. If he had been there, he would have surely healed his friend. But he hadn't been there, and Lazarus had died. But Jesus assured her, your brother will rise again. Notice carefully Martha's response. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha assured Jesus that she knew what the scriptures taught about life and death. She knew she would be reunited with her brother at the resurrection at the end of the world. However, Jesus wasn't going to wait until his second coming to call on Lazarus. He was about to give a preview of that glorious event to everyone who was at the tomb. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. As he came to the tomb where Lazarus was buried, John tells us that Jesus wept. He was not weeping for his friend Lazarus. He knew he was about to bring him back to life. He was weeping for the grief that the family and friends were experiencing and for the grief that death has caused throughout all the ages as loved ones have been taken away by death. Jesus asked that the stone sealing the entrance to the grave to be taken away. Martha objected, concerned about the unpleasant smell that would surely pour out from the tomb. But Lord, by this time, there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. But the stone was rolled away, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he did. The one who had been dead for four days heard a voice of the life giver. What an amazing day that must have been for all of his family and the whole village of Bethany. My friends, the joy that took place on the day of Lazarus' resurrection was only a small preview of the glory and excitement that will occur when Jesus comes again. And all the graves of his other friends who have accepted him as their savior are open and they rise to live with him forever. The apostle Paul describes the great resurrection to take place at the coming of Jesus. He encouraged believers to look forward to that day in hope. Paul say, but I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We are going to take the whole presentation to look at the details surrounding the second coming of Jesus, and you won't, you won't want to miss that study. One of the most comforting truths in God's word is that when a person dies, he or she rests quietly, just like when sleeping, undisturbed by the problems of life 
until the trumpet sounds and the life giver calls them from the grave. In another place, Paul describes in even greater detail the events that will occur on that day. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all asleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? Of course, this passage by Paul was in complete harmony with what Jesus himself told his disciples. Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Think about this for a moment. If people went immediately to heaven or hell at death, why would there be any need for the resurrection of either the righteous or the unrighteous? That wouldn't make any sense. If people got their reward at death, why would Jesus say that people will not receive their rewards until he returns. This is what he says in the very last chapter of the Bible. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. The Bible is extremely clear about this. When people die, the closest way to describe it is like sleep. People will rest from their troubles and labors until Jesus comes again. What is he coming for? He is coming to resurrect and be reunited with all those who accept his sacrifice on their behalf. He is coming again because he wants to be with his people and never have to be separated from them again. Hear Paul again. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Yes, friends, Jesus is looking forward to that day even more than we are. What a glorious day that can't come any too soon. Perhaps you've lost a loved one who fell asleep in Jesus, and you long to be reunited with them as I do. The wonderful news, my friends, is that the Bible's teaching on death is very clear. The dead are not aware of anything going on in the world today. They are not having to watch us suffer and go through difficulties and hardship. They're resting. They're sleeping the sleep of death. They're waiting for the resurrection morning when the voice of Jesus, the life giver, will pierce graves and tombs and they will come forth clothed with immortality. And all this is possible because of Jesus, the one who conquered death and came forth victorious from the grave. Will you commit today to be ready with him when he comes? If so, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reassuring words that come from the mouth of Jesus himself, that he is the resurrection and the life. Thank you, Lord, for the reassurance that you will grant us if one day we come to our graves before he comes. Because we believe in him, there is hope that 
He will resurrect us unto life eternal and be with him throughout eternity. O Lord, may our friends and all of us will continue to be strengthened with the hope that when you come again, those who believe in you, those who build up that relationship in you, will be resurrected when one day we will pass to our graves. But we long for that day, Lord, that we can see you face to face when you break open heaven and all the retinue of angels will go down with you to claim all your loved ones, all those who have gone ahead of us, and for those who are alive, we'll see you face to face and we'll meet you in the air. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. It's time right now for our live panel discussion on this topic of what happens when you die. And I encourage you to stay by and have your questions answered by our panelists. I invite you to join us for tomorrow's presentation where we will learn the detailed steps on making a new start in Christ. You won't want to miss this practical study from God's Word. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and your families.